Hello, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. My name is Alex Dukowski, and I'm Associate Professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at University College Dublin, and the Director of the UCD Center for Asia Pacific Research. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Dennis Staunton, uh, China correspondent at the Irish Times, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us on the theme, what is happening in China. A bit of context, as Xi Jinping's precedent-breaking third term as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party gets underway in earnest, after a series of top-level appointments in March, China faces formidable challenges at home and abroad. After three years of COVID restrictions, parts of the economy are rebounding, but important sectors, including real estate, are troubled, and foreign investors and others have been unnerved by a crackdown on high-profile entrepreneurs. Meanwhile, as relations with the United States continue to be tense, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has complicated Beijing's relationship with Europe. Xi Jinping himself often speaks about changes unseen in a century, and I think it's not a stretch to say that how the Communist Party navigates these changes will go a long way towards shaping global politics of the current century. Dennis will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so on these uh, very weighty and important themes, and then we'll go to a Q&A with our audience. Uh, a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should now see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in even throughout the session uh, as they occur to you, and we will come to them once our speaker has finished his presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Uh, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter uh, using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce Dennis and hand it over to him for about 20 minutes. Dennis Staunton has been China correspondent for the Irish Times since October 2022. He was previously London editor from 2015 to 2022 and has also served as the newspaper's correspondent in Washington, Brussels, and Berlin as foreign editor and as deputy editor. He is currently the only correspondent for an Irish news organization based in China after RTE's correspondent was forced to leave China following coverage critical of government policy. So he is in a unique position to explain developments to us in this uh, incredibly important country. I will uh, now hand it over to you, Dennis. Take it away. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Institute for uh, inviting me. It's always very good to, to talk to you. Uh, one of the things that uh, all foreign correspondents hear as soon as they get to China is that I uh, experience tends to be that after a month here, you feel as if you could write a book. After a year, you feel as if you could maybe write a chapter. And after five years, you feel as if maybe you could write a sentence. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that the place is obviously so big, it's so diverse, so populous, so complicated, and also because it changes so fast. And uh, and this is definitely, it's certainly my experience. I, th I feel as if I've kind of uh, almost uh, leapt beyond the one year stage, almost to the five year stage, so that it's difficult to, uh, so if I, if what I say is, sounds tentative, it's because I think there is a great deal of uncertainty. And one of the paradoxes is when you're living here in China, and you listen to a lot of the commentary from outside China, and I, by which I mean uh, from politicians, particularly, uh, also from some other commentators. It often uh, sounds as if it's being delivered with a great deal of confidence, with the kind of confidence when they say that China is on a particular course, and, or that China is going to do X, Y, or Z, uh, inevitably, where Taiwan is concerned. And I feel sometimes as if it's said with a kind of confidence that people would not apply to predictions about, say, the United States or Europe, uh, which are much more familiar. And I think it's particularly difficult here because obviously the leadership is opaque, uh, the media is controlled, the language is difficult, uh, there are very few uh, foreign correspondents here. And, uh, and so the information flow uh, is such that perhaps we ought to be a little bit uh, more careful about, 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 what, about the confidence of our predictions. And even in the last six months that I've been here, there have been a number of events which have confounded expectations, including my own expectations. The first was the, the nature of the end of the zero COVID regime. Uh, I certainly haven't come across anybody who predicted that it would end in the way that it did, uh, either the predict who predicted the, the protests, 
two forms. There were street protests, but then there was also a kind of uh, a civil disobedience almost where just people at, an, at, a, at a very low uh, local level were simply not applying the rules by the time you got to late November of last year uh, because the, uh, the, the application of them had become unreasonable. And, uh, and, so, uh, and, and also then the, the government response to that, the way in which the uh, zero COVID regime ended so quickly. And something else which I think confounded expectations was that uh, one of the predictions which was made very, very confidently elsewhere was that as soon as the zero COVID restrictions were lifted, uh, that you would see uh, this uh, enormous uh, surge in infections and deaths. And you certainly did see an enormous surge in infections. And there's no question but that a large number of people died, particularly in, uh, in December and in January. Uh, and it, I would also say with quite a lot of confidence that uh, those who uh, that died were larger than the official number of deaths that were recorded. But nonetheless, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the, uh, the, the number of people who have died uh, was happily much lower than uh, than was expected or predicted, and I think that you can you can tell that really partly because it's difficult to hide numbers of people. You can also just you know although anecdote is not data, in the absence of data, anecdote can be useful. And so if you talk to, for example, people who work in businesses, they will tell you, and they were telling me about people who were taking time off for funerals in uh, December and in January, and then in the way in which it uh, it tapered off. So so it does seem that uh, just on the, say purely on the uh, on the level of uh, of what happened with COVID, uh, you know we uh, it, it turned out in a way that that I think uh, nobody or very few people were expecting. And in the same way, I think uh, if you uh, you know the other the other difficulty in terms of uh, predicting what's going to happen, feeling so confident, apart from the opaqueness of the system, is that there's uh, often a, a contradiction or at least some tension between policy goals. So, for example, since the uh, end of zero COVID, uh, one of the big priorities for the Chinese government has been to open up the economy, to get the economy going again. And that means getting business uh, going again, getting foreign investment coming back. And last week I was in... Um, uh, down by the Yangtze River Delta in Suzhou. And I was talking to, to uh, officials there who were telling me about how in late November and early December, they were chartering flights to go to take their people to France and to Germany to reestablish all of these relationships and to get everybody coming back. And so there's, and you've seen, you see this all over China where, uh, you know, where steps are being taken to encourage people to come back and to get business going again. But at the same time, uh, you know, Xi Jinping is continuing his, uh, his plan of asserting the uh, Communist Party's control over more areas of life and governance. And so you saw at the recent, the so-called two sessions, which is kind of the annual parliamentary meeting here in Beijing, that uh, you know, one of the, uh, the announcement was a reform to the state council, which is like the sort of the executive, it's like the, the council. And so some functions of that, say finance, uh, technology, have been uh, you know, put under the control of the Communist Party. And so you have, in a sense, you know, you've got an opening up and you've got a clamping down at the same time. And you see this then reflected all just if you look at, say, the economic performance. You've had uh, some very some good data coming out this week in terms of uh, GDP growth, particularly retail sales up by uh, more than 10 percent. And that's very encouraging. But at the same time, you still have persistently high youth unemployment, nearly 20%. And then you also have a lot of uncertainty. And you, if you, for example, at uh, the real estate, the property market, uh, you had, uh, you know, the, the whole of the property market is facing difficulties, is problems of confidence, people not buying, not selling. And, uh, but this is particularly affecting the private sector element uh, until, until fairly recently, the you know about half of the market was uh, uh, was the, the uh, domain of state-owned enterprises, and the other half was private companies. And the state-owned enterprises have a, have an advantage, which is that they can borrow from state banks at about three or four percent, whereas the private companies they pay about thirteen percent or thereabouts interest. But they had efficiencies, and it kind of tended to work for them. But it's not working for them anymore. And so what's happening is that insofar as there is business, it's moving to the state. 
owned enterprises. And also because of the way the market works here, you buy uh, your apartment before it's built here. So if you buy an apartment, you're probably going to, in the current climate, go for a, a state-owned enterprise because you would feel more confident that the thing is going to get finished. Uh, then if you go for it. So, so if you talk to people within that sector, they'll say that they feel as if the, you know, the market could come back uh, later on this year, but at the same time, they fear, these, those people in the private sector, that you might end up with only a handful of private companies, big ones really left. And so you've got, uh, you know, uh, you have all of that happening. And at the same time, you know, uh, although that's a kind of a trend towards, uh, you know, within that sector, towards state ownership. At the same time, you have Xi Jinping and various other people within the, uh, the leadership constantly speaking about the importance of the role of the private sector. And they ultimately uh, you know, uh, are trying to encourage the private sector to create jobs because so much of the growth and so much of the job creation has been done by the private sector. You then had, uh, for example, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, he made a brief appearance uh, a few weeks ago back in his hometown of Hangzhou. And, uh, and that was kind of hailed as a signal that, uh, you know, that China was welcoming for its entrepreneurs once again. And yet at the same time, you have all of these crackdowns. You've got other business people who are being targeted. You've got uh, due diligence firms that are being, uh, you know, suddenly uh, people are going in to search them and to investigate them. And you've got, uh, you know, so you have, in a sense, you've know, got this, these sort of contradictory actions that, uh, you know, and then at the same time, lurking in the background, there is just this whole question of, uh, you know, what is the, the, uh, the party's approach to wealth, to people getting wealthy, until, again, a few years ago, it was extremely relaxed, in the words of Peter Mandelson, uh, about people getting filthy rich. Uh, now, much, much less so. Also, you know, the uh, a doctrine of common prosperity, which hasn't been entirely, uh, you know, uh, sharply defined. But what people in business tend to think is that it means that if you get very, very rich, you uh, had better start putting quite a lot of it back because otherwise, uh, you know, your uh, your wings are going to be clipped. And so there is, uh, you know, so all of these efforts to create confidence for business uh, are sometimes undermined by uh, by other efforts. Uh, and then, of course, the big uncertainty is a geopolitical uncertainty, and particularly around the China's relationship with the United States, which has deteriorated really very sharply uh, in uh, in recent years, but particularly, I would say, in, in recent months. And, uh, and really since the Trump administration, but it has been accelerated, I think, probably in the, uh, under the Biden administration, you've seen the United States adopting what China would see as kind of a, an approach of extreme economic competition, uh, where it's not simply they're trying to create a level playing field. In fact, they're trying to create a very uh, the opposite of a level playing field. They're trying to hobble China's rise. And they're doing this partly in the name of national security. But, uh, but, 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 but from where China is, this looks like very aggressive behavior. And you've had, uh, you know, there was a little glimmer of hope around uh, last autumn when uh, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping met in Bali on the edge of the G20 summit. Uh, but that then was blown off course by the whole kerfuffle over the spy balloon uh, over uh, Washington or over the United States and Washington's response to that. And so now you have, if you talk to people here, there's almost a sense of despair uh, about the, uh, about any effort to get the relationship with the United States back on track. And one person I was talking to, who's an expert in this field, was saying the other day that he thought that the US-China relationship would be very bad for the next 20 years at least, although he didn't think there was going to be war, which is, uh, I suppose, some uh, bit of comfort. But I think you do find that, you know, that, 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 that right now, people don't see exactly how you uh, you see how you find your way out into an improvement of this relationship. What people hope for is just that it won't get worse. That, that somehow they'll manage to avoid an escalation of the, the you know, uh, of their confrontation. And I think part of the part of the reason why this impression is formed here is if they could Congress, and it's very you'd, you'd work very hard to find a single member of the United States Senate who uh, speaks up for engagement with China, and that's something which is relatively new. In terms of uh, of American foreign policy, and uh, and 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 obviously the the flashpoint for all of 
and the most dangerous area for all of this is the question of Taiwan. And the US uh, has, uh, uh, in a sense, it, its language over Taiwan has changed. And, uh, and the Singaporean, uh, Singaporean Minister Lee the other day was speaking about the fact that this uh, had become uh, framed by the Americans as a conflict between democracy and autocracy. Uh, China as autocracy, Taiwan as representing democracy. And this is a very dangerous uh, framing of this because it tends to undermine the basis that has kept the status quo for so long, which is uh, the one China policy and the various caveats that have been introduced around that in uh, US legislation uh, in terms of, you know, and also the strategic ambiguity with regard to uh, both uh, Taiwan status and also uh, what the United States would be prepared to do in the event of uh, uh, any Chinese action uh, where that was concerned. Uh, the, uh, you know, while this relationship has been deteriorating, China has been cultivating its relationships with other parts of the world. It's, it, it's in a pretty good position where the global south is concerned. We saw the Brazilian president Lula here last week, and that would have been a very successful visit from the, both China and Brazil's point of view. And then if you look around this region in Asia, uh, most of the countries uh, around China, for, for them, China is their uh, their biggest, overwhelmingly their biggest trading partner. And many of them have very uh, important relationships with the US as well, and they're not willing to uh, make a choice between the two, uh, unless they're absolutely forced to. Certainly they resist the idea, and for them, the idea of this sort of confrontation between the US and China is something to be Feared. Uh, and a, a relationship that has improved in recent months is China's relationship with Australia since the uh, election of Prime Minister Albanese. And one of the interesting things there is that Australia's policy hasn't really changed at all. It's still part of the nuclear uh, deal, but the tone has changed. And the change of tone has uh, affected a change in the tenor of the relationship. And that's something which might be instructive for, uh, for uh, countries elsewhere uh, in the world and for indeed for, for China, uh, which brings us to Europe and the uh, relationship between China and Europe. China would like Europe to be strategically autonomous. It's uh, particularly keen that uh, the European Union shouldn't uh, simply uh, follow the US lead in its approach to, uh, to China. And, uh, and so the, you know, this is the context for uh, all of these recent visits here from uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, you had Annalena Baerbock, and you've had a number of others. You know, Joseph Borrell has been, uh, had, was supposed to come, but he got COVID, but he made it. He delivered or published a speech that he was going to deliver here. And so these are all feeding into, in a way, what, uh, is the, what, what seems to me to be the beginning of a kind of a European negotiation about a new policy uh, towards China. And the uh, obviously Europe's relationship with China has uh, ha had taken a number of hits uh, even before the beginning of last year. And so you've had tensions over, uh, you've you had ongoing tensions over the imbalance in the trade relationship and over what the Europeans would see as unfair practices on China's part. And then you also had uh, uh, th these uh, difficulties over, for example, over really what I think Europeans probably correctly would describe as China's overreaction in the case, for example, of Lithuania's uh, uh, opening of a, a, a representative office for Taiwan in Vilnius, and then also uh, the sanctions that were imposed against the uh, MEPs. And I think that many people here in Beijing now would probably recognize that that kind of knee-jerk response that uh, that they made, that kind of diplomacy, which was very much in vogue here uh, a couple of years ago, uh, is probably uh, it was counterproductive, and it's certainly not the appropriate uh, approach for them to take to Europe right now. And so they're taking a much more emollient approach, and uh, and we'll see how it goes. But the big problem, of course, is Ukraine, and uh, after the Ukraine, after the, the Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Last year, uh, the Europeans, uh, when they had an EU-China uh, summit online, they uh, they were taken aback by what they saw as the lack of understanding uh, from Beijing of the European 
response and the European emotional response in a way to, uh, to, to the invasion of Ukraine. And, uh, and I think it's true that, uh, that China doesn't perceive the invasion in the way that it's perceived in the West. But then that's also true of a large part of the world. And that's partly, of course, because they don't perceive the West in the way that it's perceived in the West. That's uh, the, uh, from in much of the South, they perceive that way. So the uniqueness of the uh, outrage of uh, the the war in uh, Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, is something which feels very obvious if you're in Western Europe, and it just doesn't feel that way here. Uh, China, I've I've yet to meet a single person here uh, who has said to me that the uh, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine was justified. Having said that, China has interests, and. Uh, and, and part of that interest is that uh, uh, that Russia should not be defeated and humiliated. And certainly, from China's point of view, it doesn't want to have uh, a, a large neighbor like Russia falling into uh, the American sphere of influence. And so there's, uh, you know, it, it, it's an important, it's not an alliance, but it's an important relationship uh, between uh, Beijing and Moscow. And that's uh, something which, when you're, when you're trying to, to work out what China can do or is, is going to be prepared to do where Ukraine is concerned, I think you have to be uh, pretty clear-eyed about uh, where its strategic interests lie. Having said that, uh, China has presented itself as, uh, as being a, a possible peacemaker, uh, and the, the Europeans, the Western powers, more generally reject the idea of uh, China as an honest broker. Uh, but it may be that at some stage, once the, the parties are more willing to talk about uh, peace, once uh, events on the battlefield have, uh, have progressed in one way or another, that China could play a role perhaps in facilitating with others proximity talks or some other kind of diplomacy. So I think it's, uh, it's something that, you know, I, I'm not sure they're going to be able to replicate what they did with the Saudis and the Iranians, but nonetheless, I, I do think that uh, it's, uh, you know, if the reporter that uh, Macron uh, thought that um, he could work with the Chinese to, uh, to try to, uh, to, to promote uh, a peaceful resolution of that conflict, then I think it's something that, uh, uh, that certainly shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be rejected. So I think that China could, in the future, play an important role there. Just finally, I just wanted to briefly before we go to some questions just talk about my role here and the uh, it's obviously not uh, you know it's not a straightforward place I mean you uh, uh, it's a country of 1.4 billion people and as Alex mentioned I'm the only uh, reporter for an Irish news organization here and you might well ask what can uh, one person do in these circumstances and there is indeed uh, you know a huge limit to, to, to what's possible partly because of the news culture partly because of the lack of access uh, because of you know, all kinds of, uh, of factors. But I think what, uh, what I hope I can do is to try to understand uh, the country. I also to understand actually uh, not just the system, but also what the Chinese uh, government and leadership thinks it's doing, wants to do. And also then to understand really how the society works. And, and finally, to understand uh, to some extent, the people, and to uh, to report on the Chinese people as people. Uh, the Irish Times is governed by this uh, trust, which has articles, rather high-minded uh, principles. Uh, and like many high-minded principles, they're not bad ones, uh, one of which is to promote understanding between peoples. And in the environment that we find ourselves in now, I do think that one of the functions of journalism and of being a foreign correspondent in a country like this is to uh, try to promote some understanding, is to try, I suppose, for me to try to understand the Chinese people uh, and then uh, perhaps to share that with we, the Irish And with that, I'll hand back to Alex and thank you. Mm -hmm.